Good morning. Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Lakes. What a glorious way for us to begin our week, to gather here in our Lord's house, to sing his praises, be fed by his word, and to encourage one another in this wonderful mission that God has given to his church to share the good news of his son, Jesus Christ. At this time, I would ask that you please rise as we begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. taken from Psalm 92. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. It is good 
to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Please be seated. Today's first reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak a warning to the wicked to turn from his way, 
that wicked person shall die as in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for his, he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Beca for because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. Attending to this very thing, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise. Gospel reading is from Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father 
who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, I shared with you a, uh, a definition of love, a scriptural definition of love. And I defined love in four words. Love is a decision. 
It's a choice that you make. The power of that definition means that you are the one that controls love. You can choose to love your neighbor even when their behavior does not warrant that love. And of course, what I've just given you also is the definition of grace, right? Grace is love that is given even when it's not deserved. And that describes perfectly our Heavenly Father's attitude towards us, right? After every worship service, we repeat those words from Ephesians chapter 2, right? Verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved. A love given to you by God, even though it is undeserved. Because God chooses to love you. That means that his love for you is not based on your behavior. You don't gain his favor by doing well or lose his favor by doing wrong. God chooses to love you. And then therefore, we must choose to love our neighbor. Don't let feelings make the decision. Let your mind, your will, choose to obey God's command. I shared with you that wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis, where he reminded that every relationship for a Christian, either if it's with God or with man, is an affair of the will. You choose to love. Now, there's a corollary that goes along with that. Who's got a coin? Someone's got a coin in their pocket. Someone's got a coin. All right, Rick is the winner. Thank you, Rick. Beautiful. Gang, how many sides does this coin have? I see a, a George, this is a quarter, so this is George Washington's head. Oh, this is a state quarter, nice. There's a buffalo skull, Montana, ah, oh, excellent. Heads, tails, right? A front and a back. Rick, thank you. Although I probably could have just explained that and you all would have understood, but that's okay. There is something else that is also a choice. Something else that is also an affair of the will. If love is one side of a coin, then the flip side is forgiveness. They are tied together, correct? They're connected. And both of them share the same attribute. That if love is a decision, then so is forgiveness. If love is an affair of the will, then so is forgiveness. If God commands you, as you heard Rick read, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know darn well that your neighbors are undeserving of your love. They are. Just as you are undeserving of God's love. But God chooses to love you so you can choose to love your neighbor. So what about those who have sinned against you? What about the people who have sinned against you in your life? Now first, you need to understand a couple things. All sin 
is always against God. And sometimes our sin is against another human being and God. If I were to say, why does God love you? You can now answer me because he chooses to. And if I were to say, why does God forgive you? That also follows, right? Because he chooses to. But you've noticed something, right? About love and forgiveness being a choice. Love and forgiveness being something that you control. That love and forgiveness are an affair of the will. And it's that love and forgiveness are costly. Forgiveness especially costs you something. You have to give up your right for justice. If God got justice for all the sin that was committed against him, what would that look like? It would look like the condemnation, right? The eternal condemnation of every sinner. That's what justice would look like. But God gave up his right for justice. And instead, what did God do? He condemned his own son instead. The just Christ died in the place of the unjust, all of us. Guys, that is the epitome of something that was costly. But when you choose to love your neighbor, when you choose to forgive your neighbor, you're also willingly paying the price, the cost of that love, just as God has done to us first. And you're thinking to yourself, Pastor Kurt, that's hard. You don't know the sin that my neighbors have perpetrated against me. And you are correct. I don't. But I do know the sin that I am guilty of before God. And that is a pretty large pile, if I do say so myself. When I would teach confirmation. Um, I, since I have the maturity of a 14-year-old, I, I relate really well with our junior high kiddos. And so I would frequently give nicknames to my students. And I was teaching to them a, a lesson on forgiveness. And I was making a comparison. Okay? And I used the cliche of making a, a mountain out of a molehill, right? Mountains and molehills. And we know that molehills are, well, they burrow under your ground and they live this tiny little bump. That's it, right? That's the, the sin that we commit against one another. And then I asked them, how big is the pile of sin that we have committed against God? And I used Mount Everest as my reference. And I said, how tall is Mount Everest? And there's always one smart aleck in the group, right? And so this kiddo just shouts out an answer. 
And I'm like, wow, he said that with confidence. But I know that he can't be right because who knows this off the top of their head? Now, this was before the oracle of, of Google. So we had to go back to the, the books, those encyclopedia things that I mentioned a few weeks ago. And we looked up the height of Mount Everest. And you know what? That little bugger was right, down to the foot. So uh, the teacher had on her desk um, some kind of a foam, foam sword. I don't know why she had a foam sword on her hand. Who knows? But I made him kneel in front of the class, and I, I knighted him, Sir Rain Man. The movie Rain Man was the autistic guy who was a savant who just knew this, you know, odd stuff. And so for the rest of his days in this school, he was Rain Man. I would have confirmed him Rain Man, but his grandparents were there, and, and you know, he wanted to use his proper name. But you get the idea, right? The sin that we commit against one another truly is a little molehill compared to the Mount Everest of sin that you have committed against God. And God has paid the price. He has borne the cost to forgive your Mount Everest-sized pile of sin against him. That was Jesus on the cross, correct? He paid dearly to forgive your sin. And yet, what do you and I do? And I know we're guilty. Don't shake your head and say you're not, because you are. What do we do? We look at that little molehill of sin that our neighbor has against us. And we withhold forgiveness. We choose to let our hurt and our anger and our anger make our decisions for us. I graduated from the seminary in, in 1995, but my wife was just a few credits short from getting her master's degree. And well, we wanted her to finish. And so I stayed and I uh, got some additional training. Um, and I worked as a student chaplain in a, in a nursing home. Um, and what a, what a wonderful eye-opening experience that was. Because you can look at some of these folks and all you see is a shriveled old person, crippled by, by age, ravaged by time. And yet when you get to know them, some of their stories were amazing. There was this one gal. Mentally she was great, but her body was really paying a heavy price. And she would sit in the hall and she would just chat with people. She was a very highly, let me back up, she was a high-ranking nurse in World War II. And she got to witness some amazing, amazing things. And yet to look at her, you wouldn't notice it. But there are also folks on the other end of the spectrum. I got to know a guy, and he never had any visitors. And it was clear to see why. Because he was a bitter, angry dude. You know the type. You've met the type. <clears throat> And he would look you in the eye and boldly tell you that he hadn't spoken with his son in 20 years. There was some rift between the two. And all I could think in my head was, you're an idiot. 
you're a fool. You have let Satan live in your heart and deceive you into thinking that your way of of anger and bitterness is somehow the better way to go. Now at times it is certainly the easier way to go, right? If you hold on to that unforgiveness, you don't have to pay the cost. You don't have to let go of your right of justice. But gang, what does unforgiveness do to the human heart? I'm not going to let you off the hook on this one. You have to answer. Someone tell me, what does unforgiveness do? And I'm not fishing for the wrong answer. It makes it bitter. Unforgiveness makes a heart bitter, right? You've heard the old cliche that unforgiveness is the poison that you drink hoping someone else will die. And it's true. And it's true. And while I know you have met those folks who hang on to their unforgiveness and allow the bitterness to just ferment and fester in their hearts, I'm also confident that you've experienced the healing power of forgiveness. In my job, I have seen plenty of brokenness in families. I'll never forget counseling a couple where the wife had uh, found out about her husband's infidelity. And she was angry. And she was hurt. But they both came in to talk with me. And I remember her rage and tears on her knees, broken, pounding on her husband's legs and chest in her brokenness. And yet, and yet, having the faith to trust in God and to work toward forgiveness. You see, those are hard conversations to have with husbands or wives who are the victims of adultery. A lot of times they want things to be like they were before, but that's not realistic. You see, the truth is that people don't stray from healthy marriages. They don't. So I had to look into the eyes of that broken wife and say, you can't have it as it was before because it was broken before. Adultery is just a symptom of the brokenness. It's got to be better. Not only does the adulterer have to change and confess and repent, but I've rarely seen a broken marriage that was just broken on one side. Usually it's both couples, both people. Oh, I forgot my 18-inch rope. Darn it that have to confess and repent and change. And so we began the process. Now, where do you think that wife's feelings were? If she let her feelings make her decision, I imagine she'd have killed that poor guy. And he would have deserved it. At the very least, divorce him. 
allow that brokenness of marriage, broke, break the relationship with his children. And yet, despite what her feelings said, do you know what she began to work toward? Forgiveness. Now, I don't have to tell you that this was not easy. That there was a lot of emotion that had to be worked through. But she made the choice that she was going to forgive. And she was willing to pay the price of that forgiveness, giving up justice. Did her husband deserve any of that? No. Not a drop. But as the months went by and the relationship began to heal and grow, and as the years went by, you saw a remarkable transformation in that marriage. And today, I would point to that couple, to that marriage, and use it as an example for any married couple. I love following them on Facebook and seeing all of their wonderful adventures. Yeah. Because that's the power of forgiveness. And you guys know this, right? You've heard preachers use this analogy time and time again when it comes to forgiveness. It's like a bone that's broken, right? It's it heals, it's actually stronger where there is that joining. It's stronger at that point than when it broke in the first place. And that's what forgiveness does. It's what forgiveness can do. Gang, Remember the very first reminder that I gave you as a congregation that everything that God calls us to is hard. I would submit to you that choosing to love your neighbor, choosing to forgive your neighbor are the hardest things that God calls us to do. Being good stewards, tithing what God has given to us, that's pretty easy. But forgiving those who have hurt us, loving our enemies, that's hard. I know it's hard. But I'm going to ask you to trust that our good Lord knows what he's doing. I'm going to ask you to trust that as you choose to love and choose to forgive, that you will experience the amazing blessing that come along with paying that price. And never forget that God was the one who chose to pay it first, chose to love us, chose to pay the price, what it took to forgive us by sacrificing his son. In Jesus' name.